Hey YouTube, welcome back to my channel. So shockingly, I'm not in my car. It's like 10 o'clock at night and my daughter's in bed and I actually, you know, put some makeup on today and I thought I'm gonna film a YouTube video. And I thought it's been a long time or quite a long time since I filmed a video answering your most recent YouTube questions and comments. And so I know that I don't often read the comments and I very often don't have time to respond and so I thought I'm just going to go through them in succession just the last few and answer in as much detail as I can and I want to mention before I start that I am doing coaching again so Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays from 12 to 5 p.m. Mountain Time. So I'll put a link in the description of this video to my direct booking calendar and also a um, a link to my website if you want to check out reviews or just more about my coaching style and what I'm all about and my story. But let's just get right into it right now. So I'm just going to go through them in order. So the first question was, where do you buy these? And this was about, and actually the second comment or question that I'm seeing says, what do these help you with? And these are referring to a post I made today. I just, I was going to actually bring them in here, but I, because I had seen that these were the first couple of questions, but I have a, a jar of desiccated beef liver capsules that I had posted a photo of today. You can see it if you scroll into my YouTube posts and I had captioned it, this is how I get my B vitamins or something like that. And so these questions are in reference to that. And I have had, granted it's been, I think two years since I've had any vitamin mineral testing done, but I had some, a lot of borderline or low B vitamins. The last time I had, I did have Spectracell done. So that's not serum. It's not testing the levels of vitamins and minerals in the blood, but at the cellular level. And I was borderline deficient or deficient in several B vitamins. And so, you know, I still am leery about taking medications and supplements, although I'm sure I could tolerate supplements fine now. I just am, I, I still, you know, I'm obviously don't really trust doctors anymore and definitely don't trust the pharmaceutical industry. But even I know the supplement industry is not perfect and you know, a lot of the stuff that you buy is junk and has lots of fillers and cheap ingredients. And so I try as much as I can to get my nutrients and as much as I can through food. And since I know that liver is a powerhouse um, food with tons of nutrition and it's a great source of all B vitamins, but I absolutely despise the taste of liver. And so I bought um, grass-fed, grass-finished, Canadian beef liver capsules and the only ingredients in it are this grass-fed grass-finished beef liver obviously dried and put into I think they're like I should get the bottle but like organic or some type of just gel gelatin capsules there's no fillers there's nothing else in it and it seems to be quite a high quality product and I paid enough for it but to me it's worth it just because you know I, I take my health even more seriously now than I ever did before. And so, yeah, it's just, I purchased it at the local, my local health food store. So depending on where you live, you might have different access to different things, but it, I had to do some digging to find it. And I actually had the associate help me to find it. And so I don't think I would have actually seen it on the shelf on my own. There was just one, one type and it was that one. And so I use it just for general nervous system health and because I know in the past it's shown, I've shown to be, um, sorry, deficient or borderline deficient in several B vitamins and liver is a great source of all B vitamins. So that's what I take it for and where I got them. I'm just going to go in order. So someone commented, I've had most of those symptoms referring to my, uh, the most common benzo symptoms I see video. And he said, akathisia was the worst. So yeah, most people will say that akathisia is the worst side effect or symptom in this experience. Uh, moving on to the next one. Someone just asked the question that says brain pain question mark. And this was also commenting on my video, the most common benzo symptoms I see. So the way that I hear it described the most, especially with benzos, I don't know if this person is talking specifically about benzos or just psych drug withdrawal in general, but the way that people describe it is either burning brain, head pressure, and some people will have an incredible like 
tight band feeling around their head, which is creating headaches, migraines. Sometimes it's in the face, so it can almost mimic like trigeminal neuralgia, or maybe it can even manifest as that. Um, sorry, I wasn't sure if I heard my daughter, but just, and I had a lot of like hot feelings in my face and I had this constant or not constant, but intermittent, but chronic pain right here in my cheek and I went to the dentist several times over the course of my withdrawal because I was sure I had a toothache and it never ended up being a toothache so I think it was just nerve pain that I had on the right side of my face and so the brain pain or you know head pain pressure tight band feeling burning super super common so hopefully that answers that question and like migraines type thing and anything in the face and head that like pain is is quite common that I see. The next comment says, the biggest mistake of all of our lives is having made the mistake of going to a shrink. So this is all in capital letters. Couldn't agree more, although I actually wasn't given these drugs initially by a psychiatrist. It was just by a GP and obviously didn't have a clue what he was talking about because I specifically remember him telling me when he had prescribed me this SSRI that I took for seven years that it wasn't addictive, it wasn't a hard to come off of, it wasn't like a benzo, and it was none of those things. It was not easy to come off. It was definitely dependent or habit forming, and it was just a horrific experience, although not as bad for me as my subsequent withdrawal, which included benzos, but I don't know if that was just because of the benzos specifically, or if it was just because it was a subsequent withdrawal, which is typically much more difficult for people, regardless of the type of drug. So yeah, definitely a huge mistake in my life as well was just talking to my doctor at all about a situational, I wouldn't even call it a mental health problem. It was a situational response, an emotional response, which was actually appropriate for what I was going through. But of course it was medicated. Hence why I love the title of the documentary, Medicating Normal. Perfectly sums up what goes on in our world today. So can definitely relate to that. The next one says, um, it was in response to my video, why what's working for some people may not be working for you. And someone commented, your you answers are within you. Seek there. Be still for some time. God downloads information will come to you as you need it. So I appreciate what people say and the feedback people give me. I actually recently had um, kind of gotten into it with one of my commenters that was saying basically... Um, you know, you have it so easy in the country that you live in. And if you only were in a more third world country or poor country, you'd be thankful for what you have. And um, if you would just seek God kind of thing, this wouldn't happen to you. And it was it was quite offensive because this person was making a lot of assumptions. And I'm not sure how many videos of mine they had seen. But I mean, I've made very specific spiritual videos and how much that has been a struggle for me. And I've talked to several people in coaching calls, many people I would say at this point, some have booked with me specifically for this purpose to talk about how this impacts faith. And I have many clients and I've talked to many people in this experience over the years who had great faith and were very devout in their faith. And they, they're really struggling to cling to that or to continue that just based on how much suffering they've gone through. And I did a lot of visualization, trying to manifest, um, praying. I mean, every, you know, meditation, mindfulness, every type of sort of spiritual activity you can do. I, I feel like I tried them all. And I think all of it was helpful in the long run because it kept me going. But I never felt like there was one thing, one spiritual thing that pulled me out of symptoms. Definitely not. Or I don't think I would have, I would have uh, struggled as long as I did. And I even went to, I think it was three different churches to be prayed over, anointed with oil, um, have the spirit prayed out of me. And it never made any difference. So I have done tons and tons of seeking and I'm still doing seeking you know, because I've been in this space for six and a half years. And although I'm not suffering like I used to, I still have the, what would you call it? Like a the part after a fire that's still like smoldering because I have unanswered questions. Um, how, I, I guess it's harder for me to conceive of 
God allowing these things to happen for so long to people. Um, I guess since I've had my own daughter and questioning if he's all powerful, all knowing and loving, how can he let his children suffer so horrifically for so long without doing anything or feeling like anything is being done. And to me, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that because if I had the power to take away my own child's suffering and chose not to, either I'm not capable of taking away in the first place or I'm choosing not to, and I don't know which is worse. And that, that was the way that I had been interpreting it. So you might interpret it differently and that's fine, but that's the way that I was interpreting it. And it just seemed, it just broke my heart to think about me doing that to my own daughter or allowing it. And every way that I tried to justify it, which was, oh, you know, I'm trying to teach her a lesson or this is building her character. I'm like, but does it have to take five years, you know, and why? Yeah, anyway, I, this isn't a video about that, but that was something I've, I still struggle with and I've been very open about that. So I appreciate the comment though. Um, the next one, I've been through these crying periods. I know I was strong, but wanted to know why I kept crying. I'm not a crier. Finally, I reflected one day on what I was feeling when I cried. Besides loss of emotional regulation, I was feeling grief when I cried. Then I reminded myself how healthy it is for our bodies to cry. Releases important healing chemicals. I could not agree more. Um, and a lot of people find, and I found that on SSRI specifically, the ones I was on long term, I, I lost the ability to cry, which looking back is very disturbing. At the time, I, you know, I think these drugs can be so insidious, you don't really realize what's happening until, you know, you're in withdrawal or you, I don't know, something kind of snaps you into reality and you look back and realizing that, you know, I've always been very sensitive and emotional and a feeling person, empathic. Oh, the stock cars are going. I live close to the stock car race, races. It's so annoying. But um, realizing that that is like, and the fact that I was always, yeah, very emotional, very feeling, very sensitive and lost the ability to cry. That's very abnormal and alarming now that I think back. But at the time I recognized that I couldn't cry, but I didn't see it as kind of horrifying as I do now. And there's a reason we cry and we release trauma and these chemicals that are healing, just like this person said, I know who this is, by the way, and hello. And um, when they also say, um, I was feeling grief when I cried. And I've made a video a while back called um, The Five Stages of Grief and how this journey parallels that a lot. You know, the five stages of grief, shock slash denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, it might not be in that order. And I know you don't necessarily go through them in that order, but this whole experience and journey is a process. And a lot of people experience the same types of emotions and stages as someone going through grief does. And, you know, I've seen people and my own experience was that and going through all of that, plus potentially other things as well, but those are main things. And then you get to a point of acceptance and you're not forgiving necessarily like what happened to you. And if you are forgiving, it's, you know, for your own good, you're not condoning bad behavior, but you're getting to a place of just letting go and accepting that this is what happened. You can't change the past because I've seen people really get stuck in the loop of, you know, I can't believe this happened to me. I can't believe I was so stupid and I can't like, and just looping on that. And these are people who are quite far out. I've seen this happen and I understand it. I'm not trying to minimize what those people are feeling, but you have to get to a point, at least in my opinion, as you do in grief where, you know, you, you accept, you accept it and you're able to let it go just in the sense that the weight of it and you know, being able to forgive yourself, God, whoever, you, you're able to do that and you're not condoning it, but you're just letting it go and you're, you're releasing it to heal yourself. And yeah, anyway, so once you get to that acceptance phase, it's actually very powerful. And I find that a lot of people experience healing when they're in that stage. And yeah, so I just wanted to say that about that comment. Um... The next person said, yes, I've noticed this two years ago with me, usually a day or two after the full moon, things calm down. This was in response to my video um, affected by the full moon. 
and I've noticed in myself, actually, I didn't even notice it initially. I had people that I was close to in my own withdrawal say to me, every single month, Melissa, you get really bad around the full moon. There's something to it. There's something to it. I should have got a, some water. My throat's getting dry. But, you know, as I've been coaching now for about a year, um, I've noticed an influx around the full moon. And I don't know if everybody's affected by it, but I definitely notice more people are experiencing upticks in symptoms, waves around the full moon. So, and I know that there's something to this. Like I've talked to healthcare care professionals, nurses who work night shifts at full moon and they, there is a, an increase in activity on the floors with their patients. So, and I also mentioned in that video that the tinnitus course that I took also talks about that, that people who have tinnitus tend to have an uptick in symptoms around that time of the month. So just wanted to comment on that. Um, next person said, add a girl, so proud of you. Thank you. Um, so another comment on the full moon says, booking my coaching calls around the full moons. Haha, -ha. all jokes aside, this is so true. The last few days were awful and it was a full moon. So that was that person's experience as well separate from the person who just commented before that. The next one is good work, Melissa. Thank you. Next one, if it affects the tides, it affects the body and mind. So again, in response to the full moon video. So for sure, I agree 100%. The next one is in response to my video called uh, my detailed reinstatement story. Um, this person said almost the same story with me, no more SSRIs. So yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to that. And that's why I put a full length video out about my reinstatement because re reinstatement and recovery timeline, because most of the people that I work with, and sometimes I feel like people are surprised when I say this, is that most people are not just in a single withdrawal. Most people that I talk to are in dual withdrawals and, you know, from a reinstatement gone bad. So, you know, I, I know in this community we talk a lot about or use the term polydrugging. So that would be the bulk, vast majority of the people that I coach have been polydrugged and more severely affected by second and third withdrawals than they were from maybe a single drug or a first time coming off a drug. So definitely that's very, very common with the people that I see. The next one says, yes, I saw a spike in intrusive thoughts, which were nasty yesterday here in India, which is full moon. Um, I am currently cross tapering from clonazepam to diazepam, which I am on for 20 days. And I am on fluvoxamine, amisole pride, pergabalin, melatonin. Please help me to come out of this psychotropic med medication. So you will get through it. I don't know who this, I'm not sure if I've spoken to this person or not one-on-one, um, -on -one, but you know, I've, you know, lots of people have been tapering or are tapering multiple drugs. And I'm not going to speak specifically to what this person should do because I don't know their whole story, but absolutely you can get through this and you can taper safely and get through these horrific symptoms. Most of the time, you know, we're looking for stability and that looks different for different people. Their path back to stability, whether that's, you know, holding or, you know, coming off the drug or whatever it might be. So I won't comment specifically on that, but you definitely can get off these drugs safely. And um, your experience as far as a spike around the full moon and intrusive thoughts, that was my pattern as well, because my worst symptom was intrusive thoughts by far. Next one is I had to retrain my limbic system. Chronic worry about my sweaty hands flared my limbic system up. So this is in response to the video, why what's working for some people may not be working for you. And I know I've been talking about limbic training or, or neural retraining a lot in my videos, and it's never meant to sound like a cure or a magic bullet. There is no magic bullet in this, unfortunately. But I, my own personal belief is that, you know, and coming from someone who has had chronic disease for many years, aside from this, is that most chronic conditions in my experience and from what I've seen are multifaceted. So I get that the drug caused the problem, but there may be other things required to come back from that. Um, you know, what you're experiencing now, your symptoms, it might take a multi-pronged pronged approach, approach to get well. And I see this quite a bit with people. So neural retraining is just another 
tool in the toolkit, so to speak. And I think anything you can do to calm the fear response is, is good. Whether, again, whether that's formal, informal, using a, an actual laid out program, or just finding your own way of calming down the limbic system, that's, it's a good thing. And I've talked in this, uh, about this in other videos where we already have the symptoms, which are so scary and so intense, but adding second fear and, you know, hearing all the horror stories and a lot of times what comes out in conversations with people is, oh, but I heard, you know, this person told me this and this person told me this and this person told me this. And a lot of times it's black and white thinking, it's extreme thinking. And someone said to me once, well, this is an extreme situation and I get that it is. And that's actually why I think it's more important to not have extreme black and white responses. And I get that, you know, people are just trying to help others or share their story and talking about what could happen. But to know every single situation or possibility known to man is typically not helpful and can contribute to second fear and that fight or flight response getting even higher. And I, again, I, I, I parallel a lot of things to diabetes just because, you know, it's also a chronic condition and it, it's different, obviously, but in some senses, the approaches can be the same or can be similar because diabetes is a very serious disease, especially type one, which is what I have. And only 5% of diabetics have it's juvenile, typically juvenile onset and it's insulin dependent. It's autoimmune. Your pancreas completely shuts down and it's, it can be fatal. I almost died from it when I was diagnosed and without insulin, you will die very quickly. It's different from type two, but anyway, there are, serious and severe ramifications and complications from diabetes. Um, I have a cousin completely blind from it. You know, kidneys fail and legs get amputated and gastroparesis, people end up on feeding tubes. It's very serious. And I used to be heavily entangled or involved in the diabetes online community several years ago. And I realized quite quickly that it was making me feel much worse and it was affecting my mental health in the sense that reading in succession over and over and over people's experiences and horrific complications, life-threatening, life-altering complications, and all of the possibilities that can happen from diabetes. I was just like, why am I doing this to myself? You know, I, I just, being in that space was just making me so depressed and so anxious that I had to remove myself from it because I on the one hand, you it's good to have that knowledge, like to know this is what can happen. And I already know of the consequences or possible consequences of diabetes because of my cousin, but I can't live there. Because if I do, it it the future seems very bleak. And so I have to just stay in the present as much as I can, focus on taking the best care of myself that I can and giving my body the environment the best environment possible to avoid those complications. And so I think it's the same with this. Um, the symptoms are scary, horrific, but, and, and, you know, you're gaslit in the medical community. You don't have any idea what's going on. And so you find these groups and they help you understand this is what's going on. And it can be really eye opening and you can be so grateful you find these groups, but then they quickly become detrimental for the same reasons. Seeing all the possibilities and everybody's horror stories, everybody deserves a platform to talk about their experiences. I completely agree, but don't live in that space. Like you have to disengage after a while and just say, okay, this is my experience and I'm going to get through it the way that best that I can and just stay in my own experience. <clears throat> So that's what I'll say about that. The next one is another comment. Good work, Melissa. Thank you. The next one is back in 2016, my hubby said my symptoms from a decade long infection were worse around the full moon. I ended up on beta blockers and a benzo that year due to cardiac issues. I have been at 50% in dosage for a year. And this past Saturday, I definitely had a flare up and didn't realize it was a full moon. Thank you for bringing this up. Thank you for your comment. Again, it's quite common for people to flare and me having the perspective of seeing people back to back to back day to day gives me a unique perspective in that I get all these messages in succession around the full moon so I can see how much it's affecting people. Um, the next one is primal limbic trigger from full moon. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what that means, but 
I'm assuming it means like a limbic response or an uptick in symptoms due to um, like increased limbic activity, which the limbic part of the nervous system is like what's responsible for the stress response, fight or flight. So definitely increase in symptoms. Again, you know, several people have been commenting a similar experience. So it's helpful to, to see these, um, especially if it's something you're experiencing as well to know that others are too. The next one is, I've had a terrible day in withdrawal. I thought a day or so ago I was coming out of my current wave, so maybe this could be a possibility. Again, in response to the full moon video. Um, the next one is, gorgeous daughter, God bless her. Thank you. Uh, she's amazing. Um, next one, beautiful daughter, Melissa. Again, thank you. Another one is, some of us may be considered too freewheeling. Freedom can be worth more than security. I think we need structure to maintain goals. Thank you for that comment. Too freewheeling. Freedom can be worth more than security. I agree. I think we need structure to maintain goals. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm very goal-oriented, very driven. And even when I was in the throes of withdrawal, one thing that helped me... I mean, I couldn't really make goals in the sense of like the normal sense of the word because I wasn't working and I felt like you know most goals are usually around money and you need money to achieve and that just seemed out of reach and so I did more of what I did was like a vision board where even as far-fetched as it seemed I was you know cutting things out of magazines or printing things off and just slapping them on like a board just so I could use that as part of my visualization that I did every night to try to imagine my life as a healed person and what I would be doing. So that's how I, I just in response to the goals part, that's how I approached goals because I've always been very goal oriented and driven, but I couldn't do it in the same usual way when I was in withdrawal because of how bad my symptoms were. And so that was the way that I did it then. So Thank you for that. The next one is one more thing, ma'am. Unfortunately, you are struck in a deadly loop. You think you are depressed and sad. Oh, this is the comment. Uh, sorry, this I actually deleted that. Um, this is the person that I had to block because it was offensive. Um, I can't actually open it again because I've blocked them. Uh, yeah, not good. Uh, the next one is Melissa is doing God's work, a spiritual and corporal work of mercy. Thank you so much. The next one is thank you for your advice and insight. It's very encouraging. You are so much more informed than 99% of the MDs out there. God bless you. Thank you so much. Um, that was in response to my video, if you're two to six months off meds, which I've had a lot of feedback on. Because again, you know, people have said to me, wow, like, I can't believe you're saying this because this is exactly what I've experienced and couldn't understand why. Because a lot of people think, which is understandable, that, you know, you come off the drug and you would immediately go into withdrawal. But from what I've seen, specifically with serotonergic drugs, there's a honeymoon period or there can be a honeymoon period where people feel completely normal and then they get slammed by withdrawal um, a, a one to three months in. And this doesn't happen to everybody. And it didn't happen to me. Actually, I, I was someone who was affected right away. And but a lot of people experience this and their symptoms are really, really bad two to six months off. And this can be with any class of drugs. But I, I find that with the serotonergic drugs, it's more so. Um, so thank you for that comment. I'm actually going to wrap this video up soon because I don't want it to be super long. Um, one more. Very honest catch-22 question. My stress comes 90% from my symptoms. How do I reduce the stress that perpetuates my symptoms if my symptoms are the cause of my stress? So my best answer for this would be to try somatic tracking because it's basically a version of like sitting with the symptoms and trying to not have the same type of response that you typically do. And I've seen this even in videos outside of this drug community. So even with as an example, the steady coach, which all she does is helps people through chronic dizziness. And there's people in this community who, whose main symptoms are chronic dizziness from the drugs. 
And she talks about the somatic tracking because you end up being so afraid of the symptoms and they create such a stress response that it can end up happening so quickly that you're not even really aware and suddenly you're in like a stress loop. And so doing somatic tracking, there's there's guided ones online that you can do and people have sent me if you are someone who is interested in this and wants um, some, excuse me, my throat's really dry. Um, specific recommendations or videos that you can do this through or with, then send me a message. I'll, I'll actually put my email in the description of this video. I haven't been doing that lately because I just, I can't support people through email anymore. It's just, it's too hard to answer all the questions just time-wise and without getting a full kind of back history. So I would say that is the best way to do it, um, is somatic tracking and teaching yourself to not have the same response and this is definitely a process and people do it differently and you might want to check out the steady coaches videos because i know that is one of the things that's part of her um recovery system or course i've never actually done her courses or like i've never been coached by her but i know just based on her content that this is part of what she recommends and what other people in this community have told me they've found very helpful so hopefully that answers your question so actually someone responded to that and said, try to focus on your reaction to your symptoms as opposed to the symptoms themselves. So that's basically what I said. The next person said, establishing healthy boundaries for the first time is helping my nervous system calm down. I think I am sending messages of safety to my brain, which in turn helps calm my symptoms. I love that. So I've talked about, <coughs> this is my last comment before that, from all the, the deep diving I've been doing and also talking to people, long-termers, you know, people in acute that, you know, are recovering, starting to recover, have made a recovery. What I've heard is that like neural retraining can take you to a certain level. It can help calm down that limbic response, that second fear, that reaction to symptoms. But then other people have said that and I've, and I've heard this in multiple places where sometimes you have to go a little bit deeper than that. And there may be, this is a complex thing, but there may be underlying personality traits. There might like, and I've noticed this and I've said this before that a lot of people affected by these drugs tend to be highly sensitive to begin with, like a highly sensitive person, empathic. They tend to be maybe more sensitive just in general than the average person type A's hustlers, um, people really driven, like to be in control. I have noticed that pattern. And maybe that just sets them up to be a little bit more hyper vigilant in the first place. And that could be, I don't know, this is just, these are just theories, but these are things that I've noticed. And so boundaries. So I actually, there's a book, a pretty famous book called Boundaries. I've read it before several times. I don't know if you have, but there is a workbook that goes with it called the Boundaries Workbook. And I'm actually doing it right now because this is something that, I've had problems with my whole life and putting up boundaries and sticking to them and not having those healthy boundaries that I've stuck to have led me into um, toxic relationships, whether that's romantically, um, friendships with bosses, all of those things where I just, I get pushed over and I get uh, taken advantage of. And so having healthy boundaries can really help with that. And I think yeah, just it, that's a great way that that they this person summed it up and said, you know, it's I, I feel like it's teaching my nervous system safety. And that's great. And I have noticed or I've had have had conversations with people. I shouldn't say I've noticed this specifically as a pattern, but I've had conversations with some people in this community saying, yeah, I tend to be a people pleaser. I tend to be and outside of the withdrawal experience, I think just being able to put up healthy boundaries is healthy for everybody. So anyway, I got to go drink, get a drink of water. Thank you for all your questions. I hope this answered some of them. And yeah, I have, I know I've said this before, but I do have upcoming interviews scheduled for my channel, which I'm really excited for. Stay tuned for them. One of them is going to be about um, how someone has used these mind body neural retraining and knows quite a bit about these things and has really gotten themselves far in their recovery utilizing that stuff. And this was someone that was very, very affected by these drugs uh, multiple times. <coughs> Sorry, so I'm very excited to have that her on my channel and also another one about stabilizing on meds because I know that's a hot topic in this community. So stay tuned for those and I'm gonna actually make an upcoming video once I've 
put together a nice long list of every coping skill that I can think of in one video. So stay tuned for that as well. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.